the biomass and carbon components and the technologies there. And then importantly, to give you useful weekly intelligence. And that's where we're bringing the Soil Association to leverage their understanding of agriculture, of, of what farmers need, and working with the farmers to, to build solutions that take this data and turn it to useful information for you. And that's where the co-design comes in that this workshop is part of. We want to make sure that the data we're giving you is useful, fits your needs, is at the right tempo, is at the right resolution to, to really help you understand um, biomass and carbon through the year. Um, I'll, I'll talk a bit more about all that later on. <coughs> Some high level kind of notes on this again so we all know that quality productive pasture is essential for for livestock i think it's safe to say that currently the way most farmers will be measuring the, the, the assessing the grass biomass will be walking fields with a plate meter or, or perhaps making grab samples or even using a sword stick but fundamentally visiting the fields and assessing the, the amount of biomass is available okay. and using that to influence their their pasture management decisions so we're looking to bring a, a biomass monitoring service to help um, smooth that away, bring some other data and, and reduce the, um, the amount of effort you have to go to, to go and measure that. Um, alongside this biomass monitoring, there's also carbon ready data. And that means that we're using the same data as well as assessing biomass to understand how the carbon is flowing through the fields, how much of it is being uh, stored in the soil, how much of it is being taken into the grass and, and, and used for, for feed, etc. The uh, carbon component isn't going to be the focus of this talk today, but uh, Vasilis later on can, can give you a bit of an insight into what's going on there. And these services, we want them to be readily integrated into existing farm based apps. So our objective isn't to come up with yet another platform that you have to log into but is to give you data that can feed into existing tools and existing management systems. And uh, we're looking to be designing this with 100 livestock farmers from across the UK. So um, hopefully many of you here today are already part of, of, of this. We're currently recruiting farmers in and we'll be giving them benefit uh, during this year. So a quick overview of who's involved. First off, we should thank the funders, Innovate UK. They are co-funding the project um, and it wouldn't be possible without them. Um, then the three organisations are directly uh, partnering to, to work on the service. There's Environment Systems. So we are a environmental and agricultural data consultancy. We've been going for over 10 or 15 years now working in this sector, offering lots of different solutions. There's the University of Edinburgh, um, particularly the research group that we're working with has been developing uh, carbon budget and biomass models for 10 or 15 years as well. So again, long lineage and the Soil Association and Innovative Farmers who I'm sure need no introduction. We've also got <coughs> some stakeholder partners in the project um, who are giving us a lot of insight and a lot of access into their, their supply chains. So there we've got Waitrose and the Waitrose Dairy Farmers, Dovecot, Dalehead Foods and more Valley, Valley Farmers. And I'm sure that um, they're all familiar to you and hopefully many of uh, you here today have actually come through um, those supply chains. So that's, that's all the people that are involved. It's quite broad. It covers hopefully quite a wide selection of the, a, a, a wide cross section of the UK um, agricultural pastoral sector. One thing to say is the project has a focus on England and um, because it has to because of the funding, but it isn't restricted to England. So we, I know we've already got farmers that have signed up from Wales and Scotland. I'm sure there'll be people from Northern Ireland as well. So um, the bulk of the project has to be focused on England um, because of the funding, but it isn't exclusively to England. It is, you know, in our minds, it really should be benefiting the whole of the UK. So what will the project deliver? Um, this is kind of a quick diagram that shows what, what we're trying to achieve here. We've got farmer data, which is actually the most crucial thing here. Without farmer data, all the rest of it's academic. We need to know where your fields are. We need to have an idea of the location, the extent of the fields, and some information about what you're doing on them to help set up the system. Once we've got that, we pass it into an analysis phase where we've got a load of satellite imagery and the grass model. We'll talk about them in a minute 
together with weather and climate data. And throughout the season, this data is updated and also is calibrated and validated on selected farms. Again, that's something we're looking to work with farmers to do during the project to turn it into per field report. So for each field, you'll get a weekly biomass and then some carbon information as well. Now that carbon information could be delivered at a weekly resolution, but we're not quite sure yet how that data is going to be used because the carbon market in agriculture is, is still developing. At the moment we're thinking maybe a monthly or annual carbon budget report is where it's most useful, but as the project develops, we're really interested to, to hear from you what you think is the most useful method for receiving that, that carbon data in particular. Um, and then these reports will be delivered either through some web apps, so we are committed to building a lightweight web app for the project, email and also ideally integration into other existing tools that you're already using. And this right hand side of the project is the reporting and the um, component is where the code design will really come to bear, working with you to make sure that the reports are Everybody involved in the project will get access to these reports throughout this year and next year as the project continues. I should have I forgot to mention it's a two year project. So it's continuing. Uh, it started in October last year, we're continuing on to about October, September, October 2023. Um, just very broadly to, to, to highlight where we are in the project, currently we're in the discovery phase, which is all about engaging with farmers and getting their user needs. We'll be moving into this year, the development phase, which is going to be iterative, where the data will start to be processed, produced and delivered out to you. And once that's all continued, that's all done, next year is when we really look to roll out a more finished, final locked down uh, set of services. How are we engaging with farmers? Um, primarily, it's through workshops and webinars, and we have a target of about 100 farmers signed up uh, to the service. Um, we're about halfway there at the moment, so if you haven't already signed up, please do so. Sign up process is really easy. Um, we have some conversations. We collect the outlines of at least five fields per farm. We can, we're willing to accept between five and ten fields for, for your average business. That's a very quick process where my colleague Tara, uh, primarily, uh, also my colleague Karis, will be getting in touch and, and just chatting with you and finding out some details of your farm. Um, then we've got a selection of farmers that want to go into a bit more detail that are being invited to join us for field labs. So we're also finding people that are interested in these field labs uh, where we go into a bit more detail. We ask for a bit more information back from you uh, to help us calibrate the tool. And we also have finally um, some other calibration and validation data, which is primarily being led by the University of Edinburgh, where we're really going deep on some, some measuring grass biomass and uh, using some tools to do that. Um, yes, it's everybody in the project, though, regardless of what stage you're at, you'll get the same um, benefits, which is access to these um, to the biomass and carbon reports. Um, so they'll be delivered to you from this year onwards for the lifetime of the project. So hopefully that gives you a, a kind of overview of the project. I hope I haven't gone too quickly or rapidly through there. There will be time later on to ask questions and we can talk about that later if there's any questions you have. But where I'd like to go on to next is to talk about the, um, the actual technologies at play here, what we're actually doing um, to, to give you these, these biomass reports and the carbon reports. So let me just move forward. So setting the scene wide, should we want to optimise our pasture performance? Well, there's a number of different benefits um, that, that can come from this, um, improving efficiency, reducing waste, improving soil health, better animal health and welfare, improving productivity. Uh, I believe the last workshop there was one farmer that said that the, the key thing is that all pasture farmers should be first and foremost grass growing businesses because you grow good grass, you get good product. It's very, quite, quite clear benefit there. 
So having better tools to allow you to improve um, the, the biomass, the quality, the yields that you're producing uh, is really important. The, the set of management tools you can apply, I'm sure as everybody knows here, there's different types of grazing systems. You've got rotational grazing, mob grazing, where you're looking, uh, so rotational grazing, where you're grazing and resting, maximizing the production of a grazing animal. Mob grazing, which uh, improves distribution of manure for soil improvement and prevents cherry picking of species. Um, all these things require infrastructure like fences, water trough, and frequent movement and making decisions about where you're moving those animals. Um, through your, your paddocks, through the, the biomass as it's growing. Getting that information can be quite uh, cost effective and time consuming. And so if you're looking at all these different types of managed rotational grazing to improve uh, your biomass production, it requires accurate within season information about where the biomass is. Are you on curve, below curve, um, where is the stock going to go to and is it going to have um, biomass ready at the right point for when you move it into the next system to to, to really uh, maximize the measurement of that biomass is typically quite um quite time intensive to gather sword sticks rising plate meters or cut and weigh being the three most most common um, solutions and they all suffer from the problems of uh, needing you to walk through the fields regularly, needing you to also make point samples that have to relate to a whole whole area. And that relationship from the point sample to the wider area, there can be some, some uncertainty there as well, some, some bias. Um, you end up taking a limited number of samples per field that may not be representative of the whole field. People will always have some inherent biases about places they go to. Uh, about you know the, this corner of the field, I think is represented of the field. Is it really? Um, that's that's this is a question that only taking point samples always leads to. Um, but you know they're they're well understood methods. They're they um, and that shouldn't be overlooked. That uh, having something which is simple and well understood does bring confidence. So we're not saying you shouldn't do um, plate meters, but this project is about trying to bring other data to help strengthen that basis and, and kind of give you um, more frequent observations through the year at wider scale. So, what do we do? What's the the science here? It's quite straightforward in a sense that so I'm sure everybody here is a aware satellite imagery gives you the opportunity to observe changes in the in the grass biomass and, and the amount of grass there is in a field over the course of a year so on the left hand side here we have a satellite image from a satellite called sentinel 2 that's a european satellite which is quite widely used nowadays and on the right we have a map of how much biomass there is in each field in this sense we're measuring it through a thing called leaf area index and very crudely speaking, the darker the green on the right hand side, the more biomass there is, the more crop there is. And you can see here, this was it on the 4th of April 2021. 20, uh, but you know, three weeks later or so, we're seeing that the grass has grown a lot. There is much more biomass in some of these fields. And we're able to really quantify that change of biomass through the year. We also use other satellites that can see through clouds, so things called radar satellites that can see this biomass as well. So you've got that biomass being monitored through the year by satellite data, which gives you a stream of information at the per field scale. Um, but that on its own isn't the whole solution. Um, the biomass that you're measuring, there's uncertainties there. There is um, variation that you will see between different sensors, so optical imagery, um, it's great for measuring chlorophyll content, but it doesn't necessarily it, um, measure all the biomass. It maybe saturates when it sees the top of the crop. Radar imagery can penetrate through clouds, measures much more detail about the biomass, but it's also very noisy and sensitive to soil moisture. So we get these, these satellite observations, which are really useful, give us data at scale, but are, have, have a degree of uncertainty. And that's where the modeling comes to play. So Edinburgh University have some models that link this data together to give a much better idea of how the crop is growing through the year. 
So I might hand over to Vasilis here to talk through the modeling component on this slide. Is that okay? Thanks, Ian. So um, the University of Edinburgh and the Global Change Ecology Lab has been developing and testing models for the last more than 20 years. And what these models essentially do is to condense all the science around plant ph photosynthesis into a small chunk that the model can take data on temperature and humidity and estimate how much plant will grow, how much an ideal plant will grow given these climatic conditions. And that's called in that figures what is called GPP or gross primary productivity. So our models estimate gross primary productivity and then uh, um, estimate how much of that is the respira respiratory cost. So the cost of breaking down that energy into biomass and that becomes NPP or net primary productivity, which is essentially the uh, accumulated biomass after any losses caused by the accumulation process. Essentially, it's like people eating and they need to digest what they're eating. They're losing part of that energy. The rest is, goes into their body. So that's NPP. And then that NPP is allocated to foliage, stem and roots, depending on the number of parameters. And we estimate, we, we simulate what happens when, when above ground biomass is removed and how biomass below ground will respond if there's an above ground, mass, above ground biomass removal and so on. And that biomass goes either is removed from the field, is harvested, or is grazed by animals. A part of it is respired as CO2, um, carbon dioxide is lost as methane, or returns to the soil as manure, as carbon in manure. But basically, this is called schematic in, in the if I wanted to put some numbers on that for a grassland, so a very productive grassland will have a GPP of around 2,000 grams of carbon per square meter. If you convert that to dry matter, that's 42 tons of dry matter per hectare. Half of that will be lost in the process of producing the dry matter. So it will be 22 tons of dry matter per hectare. And these 22 tons of dry matter per hectare will be allocated to different pools foliage, stem, and roots. It's very difficult to know exactly how much is allocated, but we know there's carbon and needs to go somewhere. So the satellite observations come into play by trying to, helping us to constrain what we see. What we don't see needs to go somewhere. So it essentially goes to roots, and then is a soil process that we also simulate to see what's happening in that roots, how long will they live, the roots, the roots will essentially die at some point. That carbon will be lost to the atmosphere and will also remain, part of it will remain in the soil. So we keep track, the models keep track of all these, these carbon processes and they're informed by the satellite observations on an individual um, um, field basis. Essentially, they help translate the observations, especially at the, at the upper limits of observations. So they, when volume is too, when the volume of, of grass is too high, you don't really know how much grass is there. But this, a, a model can can help uh, can help you understand how much it's feasibly possible to be there, given climate and uh, and management. Last last point here. I mean, I don't know if I need to explain the the second graph uh, because Ian will we will discuss that part. Later, so the whole process is not essentially putting numbers on the science, but because we're looking at things from 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 space, all these numbers have uncertainty. So everything that's in there, we treat it in a way that we actually know we don't know. We don't know exactly what type of grass we have there. We don't know exactly what's going on, and we put that knowledge into the numbers. So essentially, everything that we estimate has an uncertainty attached to it, following proper uh, Bayesian probabilistic uh, statistical rules. So everything we predict has an uncertainty. And just to close that, whatever we see, whatever we can see, has a lower uncertainty than what we cannot see. 
So predictions of root biomass for a field that we never visited will always be higher than things that we can see, which is the above ground vegetation of that field, something that we can see from space. Um, I hope that, that described a bit of the science and uh, hopefully if there, if there are questions, I'm, I'm very happy to answer all of them. I realise I muted myself as well there, sorry. <laughs> so you couldn't stop me from talking. No, that's fantastic, thank you. Um, I, I think the other thing to say here about this uncertainty is that the better information we can get from you about the layer to your fields, the the management compartments that the, the the paddocks that you're moving the stock through, the better that we can constrain the models, constrain the satellite data to give you really useful information back. Uh, and it's very much a a process of, of working with you because. You know, the model's published, it's well understood, and there's been lots of work developing it. The satellite data, we've had years and years and years of, of producing this data and understanding it at quite a deep level. To make it work, we have to really bring that all together with what's happening on the farm and what your management processes are to turn this into really useful data for you. Uh, and the other thing I like here as well is this, this diagram shows the, the two components of the project in one. The biomass to help you understand your, your management decisions and then the carbon which is being placed and stored in the soil to help you evidence um, what's going on there and understand how you're, how you're performing uh, on that. The data that you get, um, we will be producing, uh, here's a couple of sketches, but I, I should also say that although these two diagrams are very sketchy as to what the service is going to look like, that's on purpose because we're, we're, we're figuring it out with you. Um, we have a lot of experience of producing um, satellite data driven maps to farmers um, that show you know, what's going on per field, giving an estimate of, of what satellite data says, the current status of those fields are, how they compare to other fields. So which fields have got high biomass, high leaf area, which fields have got low. low. But then per field, what the history of, of biomass growth as, as seen by the system is. So a curve that shows you know, the amount of dry matter that's been grown and, and removed through harvesting uh, or um, by, by cattle. But also there is a predictive aspect as well where we can predict forwards as well based upon what the what the weather conditions are likely to be given the current situation, what the likely trajectory of the system will be. How useful that kind of predictive component is to you, we need to discuss um, and, and find out, you know, is it, is it, is it a date to date? What you've currently got the most useful thing? Is that a weekly, weekly uh, frequency ideal? Um, how do you want to use this data? What, what is the art of the possible? And where is it going to bring the most value? These are the kind of things we want to discuss and kind of understand during the project. So hopefully I haven't kind of blitz through that too quickly but I wanted to give you an overview um, we've got really the point today is to get into the breakout rooms and hear from you um, so it, it might be Ian a good um, chance to pause at this point and see if anybody's got any questions of maybe especially the last couple of slides but um, before we hear from Rosie um, if anybody has any questions on the last few slides or anything that we've said so far um, pipe up, you can unmute yourself with a little icon that will be either at the top or the bottom of your screen, um, depending what way you're joining. Um, one uh, question, can you hear me OK? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Paul Henman. Um, often one thing I think a lot of farmers be very interested in is, is, is that we're probably more focused on the digestibility of <clears throat> rather than the total biomass. You know, total biomass is probably easier to measure, but the digestibility is what matters certainly to most dairy farmers. Very, they're very, very, very focused on the quality of that, the D value of that forage. Just wondering what your thoughts are on that. What sort of things would be good indicators for digestibility? Are we looking at younger shoots as more useful than older shoots, or yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, certainly. You know, great. You know, growth stage is massive impact on that, of course. Um, 
<clears throat> but certainly dairy farmers have been very, very focused on that. Um, uh, and also, I think just on that biomass, that description of biomass, if you're trying to make that more uh, relatable to the farmers who are doing recording, um, they'd probably relate it back to kilos of dry matter yeah. per hectare. That's yeah. something they would relate to. Uh, uh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, we're using biomass as quite a general term, but yeah, kilograms dry matter per hectare, when we've done this work before, that's been the, the parameter we've been, been working with um, for sure. It, in terms of the digestibility, the best thing we could get there is if there is, if that's recorded, being able to kind of get measurements of that that we can relate to the data, because I would be confident, confident, I would sure there would be a relationship between when you, you harvest a field when the field is, is grazed and then as it regrows, points on this curve that will give you an indication as to how that growth stage will change over time. Um, that will be driven by weather and the weather is a component of the models. So I'm sure that's the sort of thing that could be looked at and addressed, but we'd need some good data to kind of to link that together. I mean, do you have any thoughts on that, Vasilis? Uh, I think that probably the, if, if the thing that you can see from space and can give you some information on di digestibility is nitrogen. Okay. So, I mean, we can see nitrogen from space on vegetation and nitrogen is an indi indicator, as a proxy for prote protein level and carbohydrate uh, strength. So, if there are fields for which we can have measured indicators of digestibility over the years or maybe a previous season, we can probably try and see if we can see nitrogen. We, we can see nitrogen for sure. But if we can link estimates, satellite-based estimates of, of grass nitrogen with what has been measured. I don't know what could be measured in the field in terms of the, how do you measure uh, digestibility in the field, probably I guess it's probably something that's measuring a nitrogen. Again, you're probably measuring nitrogen somehow or a proxy of nitrogen. Uh, uh, I yeah. think, I mean, I think farmers would not routinely be doing, um, you know, devalue or digestibility uh, assessments typically, but I, I suppose how they are doing it, it you know, since the last defoliation when it's grazed, particularly on grazing field, when it's grazed off, um, the days of regrowth give an indication of um, digestibility, really. That's probably how they map they would manage it in practice how many days since it was last raised yeah. Yeah. i'm thinking that, that yeah. something's definitely doable, doable in, in the existing system just an advanced an extra layer would be tracking the nitrogen part because i'm assuming they're applying fertilizer for some for a reason which is to have certain protein level at their other grass which make it more palatable to the different types of breeds of animals that are grazing the field so uh, it's a bit more complex, but definitely we can track. Yeah, I think that's something that we can look at in more detail as part of the trial. Um, so thanks um, for the, the question. That was a good question and the answers. Um, I'm just going to check on my list uh, to see who's got their hand up. Mary Watson um, and Hi. other folk can find the icon to put their hand up um, if there's anyone after Mary. Um, and then after that, we'll hear from Rosie. Right, Hi, ahead. I don't can can you hear me? Because I yeah. usually have mic issue. Oh, good. So I was wondering, um, how about pasture diversity, species diversity within the pasture, uh, which is something that I am also very interested in, and how the model would cope with growth rates of a more diverse pasture. And that's a really good point. Um, it's something that we're trying to address partly in the project by getting as many different types of pastures, grazing systems, species mixes as possible into the project to get data to help us calibrate that. Um, it, it's a case of if, if we have data to calibrate that we can teach the model on these types of pasture, your certain tweaking factors are within this parameter and that parameter. In these types of pastures, it, it's different. If 
we have that data and that's what we want to gather from during the project is data on on the, the diversity of pastures so that we can calibrate and validate and build that in when we take it to a farm and the farmer says actually the details on my pasture is this this and this we then have some pre-built references to kind of tweak the, the model to within if however we're working blind you'll just be using a generic kind of set of values for grassland so again this is where the kind of the working with the farmers is really important we're not trying to say that we know it all but it's about working with you and the more data you can give us the better we can calibrate it and actively running the model um, as a service it's going to be a case of oh right, they're on these sets of parameters because it's that type of grassland so does that answer your question yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just hopeful that you were taking it into account. So that's great. Absolutely. And, and this is where, you know, flag your interest, tell us about your farm, and the more data you can give us in the project, the, the better we can calibrate and validate and give you the benefit. So, excellent. Thanks. That's great. I think we've got one more question from Mark, um, and then we'll hear from Rosie. Uh, thank you. Um, sort of along similar lines to the last speaker. Um, when it comes to the biomass and you know the potential garb carbon sequestration and, and that sort of thing, um, clearly you could put a lot of input onto a grassland and increase its biomass. But in one respect, that's uh, that's quite quite good. But in other respects, when you look at the bigger picture, all the carbon that's gone into the fertilizer production and everything else um you have to take all that into account obviously and i'm just sort of thinking holistically now mm -hmm. um does this project sort of you know does it help you tease out where some of the sort of most optimal processes are such that you are not only getting production but you're not you're seeing the bigger picture in terms of other problems environmentally such as potential runoff um and and, and all the energy that's gone into the production of intensive uh, fertilizers and that sort of thing so i think that total carbon budgeting is is not directly within the scope of the service itself but that's why we see our services fitting within existing tools that help you think about that kind of approach you know your your agriculture total uh, was it the cool farm toolkit i think uh, apologies if I'm getting that right. Okay, Colleen's nodding, so I have remembered the right name. Um, okay. Thank you. Yeah, close enough. <laughs> the We're not trying to answer everything here. We're trying to give you some evidence over a component which is, is difficult to understand, which is that kind of the, the biomass cycle through the year and the carbon cycle through the year. But it does need to be used within that wider context of what your total carbon flow is. So we see it as evidencing a component, but not trying to do the whole thing, but giving you better numbers for one component. Now, the, the, the runoff component, for example, that's something that Environment Systems, you know, we offer some services there as well. There's any number of other companies that, that also offer similar services about, you know, thinking about your, your farm as a whole, your estate as a whole, where the carbon stocks are, where the opportunities are, where you might have risks of runoff if you, you apply at certain times of the year when the soil is bare. So I think you do have to think about it holistically, but you probably have to take these services together with some other things to build that full picture. And in the project, we want to help a bit of it, but not try and answer the whole thing because, um, yeah, there's a lot to think about there. Uh, and we just want to focus on what our bit is good at, but work with people to to bring the rest of the picture. Mm -hmm. uh, See how waffling too much there. Thanks, Ian. That's great. Um, if you can pop onto the next slide, um, and then we're going to invite Rosie um, to talk for a few minutes. Um, we've asked her just to talk about your experience and um, where you think some of these things might be useful in helping you um, sort of make management decisions on your farm. I guess. Um, so Rosie, if you're able to unmute yourself um, and the floor is yours. Can you hear from me everybody? You're a bit quiet. A bit quiet. Um, can you hear me better now? Oh, yeah, that's much better. Thank um, you. That might help. Um, hello, everybody. Forgive me. I'm not really used to doing this sort of thing, so <laughs> bear with me. Um, we're dairy farmers 
producer processes in Somerset. We're organic and we run Guernsey. So in some ways we're already on the back foot with a, quite a, a low grade cow and then not being able to increase our inputs with fertilizers and everything. But we try very hard um, to run a, an ABC grazing system on robots. So basically, if you think breakfast, dinner and tea, our cows are out 24 seven for, well, for an extended grazing season and are bringing themselves to and from pasture from the paddocks on their own. And it works by going through a grazeway system and dividing the farm into three districts. So I think breakfast, dinner and tea, some people call it A, B and C. But if you think we've got tracks that go to all our existing fields on the farm, we never change the structure of the fields or the hedges are there. We use all the fields as they were, but we have tracks and a quite a, a, a good system of, as you can see, um, ex railway sleepers around the farm. So we can get, because we've got very heavy clay, wet, horrible ground, so you can get out at both ends of the season as well as in the middle. And it works by the cows. Once they've been milked in the robots, will go to the grazeway. And the grazeway will swing them onto the breakfast track, the dinner track, or the tea track for eight hours. So from 2 a.m. to 10 a.m., the cows are going to go down the breakfast track. And so they do move in the night. And that is quite crucial to getting cows moving, is to get them on that two o'clock gate change. They go down there. We've given them basically a 10 hour allocation at that point. Those cows go down in drifts. They travel on their own. You can see from the photograph, they travel independently. They may travel in friendship groups, but they're not traveling as a herd. And so they will go down to the breakfast area. The gate change for that area. I don't know if that's my internet. No, I think it's, I think. Our roses. I think we've lost Rosie. For you too. Yeah, I'm afraid so. Hopefully she'll come back in a little second. The joys of working on teams. <laughs> I think that's the joys of rural broadband. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So while we're waiting for Rosie to come back on, um, I wonder if it's worth looking at the breakout slide or if that just confuses things a little bit or if there's any other questions. Don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just wait another wee second and see if she can manage to get back into the meeting again. Um, but I think from my sort of chat with Tara, um, Tara, I don't know if you want to sort of chip in or not, but um, it sounds like Rosie was sort of going to be saying or hoping to say um, that they've sort of tried a few different things and, um, you know, cha making changes to how they make their decisions and um, you know, knowing how much grass they've got where and that she was thinking that this might help them make some of their decisions on when to when to use different parts of the farm and just for calculating how much um, grass they're, they've got and going to have. Yeah, I think that was pretty much it. Um, I'm just pulling up what we spoke about before. So um, I think she was also going to say a little bit about um how um in their opinion they thought they should be measuring grass biomass um more uh, here we go rosie than they were is rosie back again yeah <laughs> sorry that's probably my internet the irony of it is they're actually putting full fiber to the door as we speak and they are out in our fields <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, we can hear you again. Thanks, Rosie. That's okay. Quietness. Um, yeah, so the cows are grazing on their own. Some will do breakfast and dinner. Some will do breakfast, dinner and tea. Some will do um, all combinations because we don't, don't expect them to all get to all three paddocks each day. We have in two blocks. 
So the fresher calves might be do doing all three paddocks. Staler cows may be a bit slower and heifers have to learn the system. So they might only get to two paddocks. But we, mean sit they we ensure they move on by moving the fences at about 15, 18 hours. And if there's anyone left there, we sweep them home and they come back to milk. So because we're on this system and our land is divided by a, a lane, we have a definitive grazing platform for the dairy that is clover and ryegrass and permanent pasture. We then have a definitive conservation platform, the other side of the thing, that we can graze young stock and maybe some of the dry cows. And then we have offline land that we only conserve. So we are trying to grow different, we're trying to improve our proteins, obviously, because we're um, organic and everybody needs to be growing their own protein. That's, that's the problem at the moment. So we do grow a lot of lucerne and clover and mixes of that sort. Um, and for me, I think it's going to be very useful. We don't measure grass and I'm, I would say I'm pretty good at getting my allocation bang on, but it's by doing it day in, day out, knowing the fields and knowing that, well, even though this one is this high on my welly, it feeds better than it looks. So it's going to be interesting to see whether the data you come back with matches up with my gut feeling <laughs> on pasture management. So I feel quite a fraud talking to you. We're making our system work and it does work. But I don't think I'm probably doing half as much as a lot of the people on here today. Is that enough? <laughs> yeah, no, I don't I don't think yeah, I don't think you can call yourself a fraud at all. Um and I think that'll be, you know, there'll be a whole spectrum of systems that people are employing. So for all the people on this call, I think there'll be, you know, sort of lots and lots of different ways that people are measuring or not measuring and how they're making decisions on on how they're moving animals through and how much they've got and what they're going to do with it um so i think some of that will come out in the breakout chats that we're going to have next um and i'm go just going to see who's got their hand up there for a question i think we've got time probably just for one question and then we'll go to the breakout but um so it's paul henman yeah um can you hear me OK? Yeah. Um, yeah, just sort of following up on that point, I, I mean, I would see I work also as a, as a farm consultant as well as having a little bit of uh, land we manage ourselves. But uh, the majority of the dairy farms I would see, I would say that uh, the vast majority don't actively measure grass. I would probably say 10, maximum 15 percent, maybe act actively measuring grass with plate meters and things. I would say that's not to say they don't measure the grass. I think like um, the last speaker said there, was it Mary? Um, they're doing it by eye, um, uh, you know, so they're not not measuring it. They're just doing it sort of quite ad hoc uh, day by day. Um, so it'd be interesting to see. And I think I'd say the value of this potential scheme to me would be to widen it to encourage more farmers to do it more accurately. Um, some of the ones that are doing it already probably my gut feeling will be it's you know if they are going out with the plate meter doing it you know m measuring around their farm weekly as some of them will be doing that there's probably nothing better than doing that on the ground there and there it's the ones we want to get the ones that are probably doing very very little at the moment to try and improve their yeah their management would be my thoughts but anyway just a thought yeah interesting discussion in our, our group so about um, a third of the group were perhaps using plate meters I think we had quite a few dairy farmers in our group um, and we talked about the fact that weekly um, data and insights would be useful but so too would forward-looking predictions in terms of thinking about if you make need to make a decision and a change but we soon began to unravel that this could get very complex quite quickly and one area that we started to explore was how can we um, through the pastoral tool also take into consideration not just the quantity of livestock that are, that are grazing and using the lands but also what they are um, in terms of their breed and their age and, and perhaps where they might be in terms of um, the farming calendar if it's a case of tupping um, what data you might need to sort of help inform that if it's um, 
post having calves or or where quite we could be. So Vasilis and Karis were in, were in the group and, and we did start to think about that. And again, I think that just shows to what Ian has already said a few times today is how important it is that we've got this real information to understand what's actually going on, on the farm. Because I personally haven't even really thought about um, the difference between um, breeds of cattle, let alone if it's for, for dairy and beef and on what different questions that you might have. So there's quite a lot to factor in. And I think that's an important point in terms of um, the predictive models to understand growth rates um, and also that combination of visual as well as how to interpret the data so yes you get um, some metrics that come to you but what might the tool tell you in terms of actually your performance seems to be behind what we should be expecting for your soil type your location the weather um, perhaps you need to think about um, yeah what, what, what you might need to think about and the final thing was that there's um there's probably more from the groups they can chip in in a minute um was also that there's multiple people who are working on on some farms um so it's a tool that would be helpful full um if you've got a, if you've got a team of people that are making the decisions around pasture management and and care for the livestock so just how easy and simple it is to access and use and i think nearly every comment did have a make it simple make it easy um and uh that was what was happening i don't know from my group if there's anything else you're desperate to say that's my attempts for feeding back Excellent. Thanks, Thank Ellen. You. Yeah, if anyone wants to add anything, um, can chip I just, in. Can I just say something, sorry? Yeah, yeah. Um, it would be nice to have that data going all the way through the winter, not just saying, oh, we've finished grazing, because obviously there is this thing with manure applications and is there a need for the plant and the requirements? So it would be really nice to have that data going on so we do have some proof. Thanks, Rosie, that's great. Yeah. Okay, Jerry, will we move on to your group? Yeah, okay, so a um, bit smaller group, mainly dairy, mainly dairy, but not totally. Um, the major, one of the major areas that was commented on is that role of the app to be benchmarked against what's happening on the farm, so that if I'm measuring it at 2.1 and they're saying 2.5, actually getting that right, and that then links across to that question of other people being involved, so that maybe um, one of the farms it was a variety of people actually did the measurements. But it wasn't always the same person. So trying to get some benchmarking and consistency through there um, so we could check what's going on, particularly on the basis that if you can start using this technology to determine which fields you're putting your stock into. And if you haven't got enough food there and it's wrong, you end up underproducing. And that's the sort of thing that destroys the technologies. If the story gets out, well, I fed my cows on the system and, it, and they, they didn't give as much milk. And that's the negative stories that comes out rather than potential positives. Um, the other question or point that was raised, that it's a useful method to look to the poor performing land, see which fields are not actually achieving. Um, as a measure of whether or not it could be reseeded or not, which ones are not up to step, to spec. So using that as a method to make the management decisions. And there was also the point of how to make use of new land and so measuring the, the, the growth variations on land that you've taken on or brought in into the rotation because they will grow at different speeds or different rates. And so determining which ones to go to next is useful. And, and the point was I did ask the question about the quantity and quality and reality for feeding a cow. If you've got a grazing rotation, you would assume the quality will be fairly consistent. So the quantity is really important. And although the point was made about the quality and the nitrogen, it is quantity. It's how many cows you can fill up on that area of field in the day is something that's very important to a dairy farmer. I think that's pretty well the basis. I've got a bit like you, my um, Padlet didn't work properly, so I got scribbles all over a piece of paper, which you'll love to see, Colleen. That was just, just what you need to yeah. see with the handwriting. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we'll collate it all. I think um, you do it all sort of you think it's all going to go smoothly and then you sort of we still always end up with scribbles on a bit of paper. Um, but that's fine. I think we've um, it sort of sounds like there's a few common themes. So in our group, we were talking about um, the sort of complexity as well and um, for different parts of the farm and the sort of diversity within fields. So we talked a bit about the sort of scale that this information would be useful in sort of whole fields and the sort of resolution that you could get down to um, in terms of how 
close you measure it. Um, also, the sort of time scale for predicting forward or planning forward um, being sort of weekly and a few weeks ahead kind of thing to help with that planning side of things. Um, we had a bit of a, a range of in terms of what people are currently doing. Um, so a lot of people using sort of the side of their welly, um, some plate meters um, and some sort of doing it by eye. So a bit of a range again. And we did talk about, you know, some people who've been doing it by eye, um, a bit like Rosie, you know, if you've been sort of doing it for a long time on an area that you know really well, you know, that might just work really well for you. Um, but where this might also bring value is to sort of give confidence to what you're doing. You know, if you're doing something that does work for you, um, can this sort of add a bit or just help you plan a little bit further in advance um, or just give confidence that actually what you've been doing has worked quite well, as well as being really useful for people who haven't been measuring very much so far um, and and sort of getting people into the habit of regular sort of assessing what you've got, what you're going to have, where you're going to use things. Um, and then we were talking in terms of what else would be useful, things like soil temperature, temperature, all the sort of weather data, which will be part of the model um, and kind of integrated in. Um, we talked about sort of rainfall water content of the soil and, you know, how dense that is. Um, spread of things across the farming calendar, um, different points in the growing season, but also sort of tupping, lambing, pre and post um, before your house and cattle or when you're going to be bringing them out. Um, and gaps in the technology, sort of differences in growth rates then also talking about clarity of definitions as well um, and, you know, sort of fitting it into what type of system you've got. So how it can be sort of applicable across different types of systems um, and then kind of how you interpret it. So I suppose that kind of ties back to, you know, if you've got multiple people doing the measurements at the moment or if you've got multiple people using that and for the decision making, I'm kind of thinking about how everyone's sort of on the same page with maybe how they interpret that as well. Um, so I think oh, we're doing not too bad for time. I thought we might go over with the kind of feedback, but um, is there anything the last couple of groups want to add in um, in terms of what you were chatting about in your group or what would be useful to know um, as part of this? You know, what would, what would be a useful thing? And if not, we'll, we'll go on to the maybe the penultimate slide, Ian. Oh, was someone going to come in there? No, maybe not. Um, Ian, if you could go back to the slides and share your screen again, please. Um, then I think we'll, we can just sort of sum up. And I think everyone has, well, so in terms of sort of next steps, We've got the how to get involved slide there that probably a few of you will have seen and a few of you will have done all of these things. Um, but as a sort of short term next step after this webinar, we'll do a sort of follow up email um, with the summary of what the chats were. Next steps if you want to get involved with the project, if you aren't already involved with the project. Um, so I think quite a few of you are already signed up and have spoken to Karis or Tara. Um, but if not, we'll make sure that the sort of follow up email has all the contact details of everyone um, so that you can get in touch and see what's involved to be part of the project. We're going to do some more workshops, um, but hopefully on farm next time. So we'll see what parts of the country are best for the sort of spread of people to get a couple of meetings on farms so that we can kind of look at some grass and be standing in some grass um, and talking about what things you'd be measuring, what's part of the project. Um, and then to see, you know, how many people want to get involved or if you'd rather be sort of kept in touch by email, um, perhaps part of a field lab or doing the sort of validation further down the line. Um, and Helen, I don't know if you want to come in um, with anything that I've missed there in terms of sort of summing up um, or the next steps part of it. No, okay. I think that that's mostly it. Um, as we said at the outset, it's really important that we um, 
have um, your time and your input um, as we've had today. It's been really helpful to sort of make sure that we're making as, as rounded and as comprehensive a, a solution um, that it's a tool that will be actually practical and helpful. So um, the ways in which to be involved um, and I think there's a, there's a slide that includes the benefits, but we want to also share with you the information that we're, we're, we're gathering and the data. So you'll be able to get some insights as you go um, by being part of, of this project. So um, I just sort of recommend there's lots of different ways that you can be part of what we're doing. I know the team really want to have, and I don't know if Ian wants to come in, in terms of data um, on the fields and samples, as well as um, the exciting work that will take place in the field labs that we're looking forward to, to working with a number of you to be part of that testing and validation. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't turn my camera on. Apologies. That's no, okay. I, I think that, that covers it, um, Helen. Um, just to say, yeah, the the benefits really, it's it, the principal benefit will be if we do this in, involved in the project in whatever capacity, as long as you've signed up and given us the details of your fields, we will be giving you examples. We'll be giving you access to the biomass and, and carbon services as they develop. Um, they won't be switching on on the 1st of April, but as soon as we can this year, we will be getting data flowing to you for you to give us feedback on and, and help us improve. In, in terms of that calibration validation piece, um, the sorts of things we're looking for from people are if you do record um, what's going on in the fields, if you are able to plate me to send that data to us, that's a sort of calibration validation data that really helps. Information that will be captured during the, the onboarding. So if you haven't already, um, if you have signed, I know there's a small number of people that have signed up initially, but we haven't managed to schedule the uh, follow up. So Tara will be chasing those people, making sure that, that you, you don't miss out. Uh, and also anybody that has signed up and hasn't yet finished the online survey, that's also really important just to help us get an idea of what's going on in your farm and, and to get an understanding of, of what your practices are. And the other benefit, of course, is being involved in these these, meet, these conversations. Um, there's, a, there's a really interesting package of activity that's planned during the next year and a half of the project and and we hope that you find it useful and i certainly am um i don't think there's anything else to say on that helen that's from my great. side thanks ian um has anybody got any final questions before we wrap up i um i'm conscious that being in Aberdeenshire, i might be some distance from any um real life field events that go on so would it be possible for some form of live streaming to enable me to still participate in it? Also, I'll be lambing sheep and that sort of thing. So if you do a live on, on farm event somewhere in the south of England, would you be able to do some sort of live streaming to still enable me to feel part of it? I think that would be really interesting to explore. Yeah. Looking at my colleague Anna, you know, we've totally failed a little bit today on um, behind the scenes on some things. So it's going to take our technological capabilities to another level, but we should really um, look into that. So good point, Mary. Thank you. As Mary was Great, saying, you. Yeah, I was thinking of the possibilities of Facebook Live and things like that. So I think that yeah. we mm -hmm. can try to find a way of doing it. Yeah, yeah, because I think looking at the um, the sort of spread of where people are who've signed up so far there is quite a spread right across the country so I think um, you won't be the only person that would probably welcome being able to follow it either live or you know would be sort of recording um, some bits of it as well so I think if we're able to do sort of some live and some recorded stuff that people can watch later um, when they're not in the middle of lambing sheep um, then I think that'll be really good for going forward. And so we'll send out a follow up email after this event and um, with all the sort of information and contacts. So if people do have other questions or thoughts after today, please just get in touch. Um, all our contact details will be there. And I see Paul with his hand up again. Yeah, no, I just thought um, it would be I think I think the interesting thing with this is you've got probably got a group of real enthusiasts who join this. Um, which is great and needed to get the sort of the basis of the information there. But I, I still think that the critical bit is for most farmers, grazing is just one of the many, many tasks they're doing. And so it, it's the simplicity of the tool that ultimately comes out is crucial because most dairy farmers or farmers 
general, they're looking to simplify their lives. Their lives are vastly too complicated already. And it's trying to get something that's really simple and quick and easy to use. And I think that'll that'll then be the massive benefit for mm -hmm. the for the bigger majority that probably aren't yet engaged in 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 the, in the recording at all in any sense. But just a thought. Yes. Very, very quickly, just respond to that. Thanks for that. Absolutely. Um, and it's interestingly, that's one of the reasons why we're very committed not to just produce yet another platform and yet another mm -hmm. website. We really see that the solution here longer term um, is partnering with existing systems. You know, and we are having conversations alongside the project to get this data into existing tools so that people don't have to, as you say, have yet one more thing to log into and, and monitor. So that's our kind of the, the commercial strategy of the service that comes off the back of this. Um, yeah, no, that we're obviously taking to the market. Great. Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, right. If that's it from everyone, we'll wrap up now so you can click the red button at the top or bottom of your screen that says leave. Um, and then we'll be sending around all the follow up information and I think be speaking to quite a few of you in the next few days, weeks over the next few months. Um, so I look forward to seeing some of you in person at some point. Um, that will be <laughs> lovely to start seeing more folk in person again. Um, and yeah, good luck everyone. Have a nice rest of your afternoon. Thanks for your time. Thanks all. That's great.